Welcome back to Yu-Gi-Oh! History with Joe Girlando. In today's video, we are going to September 2006, a brand new format that we have yet to profile, and taking a look at one of the most iconic and infamous decks of all time, Chainburn. Chainburn was released as a deck in November slash December of 2006, so technically not right in September. However, at that point in time with the release of Cyber Dark Impact, it brought us one of the most infamous decks of all time, a deck that is almost timeless in the sense that Versions of Chainburn or Burn decks based on some of these cards like Chain Strike and Accumulated Fortune have lasted over the course of almost 20 years now, right? It's been about 15 or so years since the release of Cyber Dark Impact, and over the course of Yu-Gi-Oh's history, there's been many incarnations of decks based on these Chain Strike strategies. Playing against Chainburn is obviously very frustrating. It's one of those rogue decks that you often don't have a lot of main deck outs for, that you need to have really robust and powerful side deck cards like Royal Decree and Jinzo to counter, and it's a deck that, as I just alluded to, was seemingly timeless, even when cards like Chain Strike were limited, which it still is on the Forbidden and Limited list. When you take a look actually at the moment in which it was released, a little bit of an interesting discussion because a lot of players viewed Chainburn, you know, as a tier two, tier three rogue strategy that wasn't going to be very effective. I, however, I remember back being very young when this happened, was a firm believer in the strategy, right from the release back in 2006. These cards were incredibly powerful, and some of the decisions that players needed to make when developing their chamber index was the big decision, how many monsters do you play? I always thought the answer to that was just zero. A lot of players would debate, well, if Morphin Jar ever resolves, you know, theoretically you go set Morphin Jar, set five, pass. If Morphin Jar resolves, you win the game, which is absolutely true. I always liked a version of the deck with zero monsters. So I'm talking no Morphin Jar, no Mecha Dog Marion, none, nothing, because it made your opponent Cyber Dragons, Zaborgs, and Noblemans of Crossout basically dead draws. None of them would have any flexibility whatsoever because you're never putting a monster on the field. If you suddenly set Morphing Jar, yes, your opponent can go Cyber Dragon to the board. Obviously now all of a sudden two cards in their hand that were dead got unlocked because of that. And yes, there's that high upside of resolving it. But to me, you didn't even need to summon set Morphing Jar. Your Chamber and cards naturally are going to beat your opponent even without access to Morphing Jar. And to me, one of the advantages in game one was acknowledging that your opponent would be clogged with all of these dead draws and not playing Chain Burn to try and race your opponent down to zero life, but to actually play it more passively, knowing that the format's not all that aggressive, and that you have cards like Wabaku and Threaten Roar anyway, and that you can build up to those big chain links with accumulated fortune. To me, the card that differentiated an effective Chain Burn player from a player who wasn't really well tested with the deck, who didn't really put in a lot of work, was how you functioned with accumulated fortune. It was the most pivotal, pivotal card, because you needed to play the deck in such a way that it wasn't a dead draw off the top. You needed to resolve those accumulated fortunes in consecutive turns as best to your ability as possible so that you actually had the cards necessary to deal 8,000 damage. And if you understood that your opponent's going to be drawing all these dead cards like Cyber Dragon and Zaborg, and you're not feeding into those cards by sending things like Morphin Jar and Mecha Dog Marion, it actually gave you the flexibility to draw cards and hold on to them, right? There's no need to rush to activate Poison the Old Man. Poison the Old Man is a stagnant default quantity of damage. So holding it in your hand until you can build up the chains with accumulated fortune really differentiated players. I think one of the misconceptions about this deck is you draw your hand, set five, pass, you flip them all up, and then from that point you hope, hopefully drew a few cards along the way and eventually burn your opponent out, when in reality I think the way of playing this deck was, you know, entice your opponent into a heavy storm early. Once they use their heavy storm or their MST, now cards like Dimension Wall and Magic Cylinder become better, Gravity Bind can steal wins, and if there's a default quantity of damage attached to a card like Poison the Old Man, there's really no difference between using it on turn one or turn three. It's 800 damage no matter when you activate it. And if you can save that card so that it builds chains with chain detonation, chain strike, and accumulated fortune, you can end up winning games that other chamber and players might not have actually won. So to me, the zero monster deck was really important. It gave you more time, in my opinion, to actually win the game. I think it actually increased your odds of winning by cutting cards like Morphin Jar. Lava Golem is the only card I could consider as a monster, but even then I wouldn't have run Lava Golem personally. So today we're gonna to take a look at Chamber with no monsters. Some important things to note. As I alluded to, this deck was legal specifically after the release of Cyber Dark Impact, and I could have profiled just tons of different Chamber and strategies over the next decade plus of Yu-Gi-Oh's history. I think it's interesting to take a look at the very first incarnation of Chamber, so that's specifically the one that I'm gonna profile. Interesting thing about this, Chamber and's first event was the last event that Cyberstein was legal. After the SJC in San Jose, Cyberstein was emergency banned. It actually won the event in the hands of David Rodriguez. I have still decided to build a deck authentic to YCS, or rather SJC San Jose. So my side deck is actually going to be a transition side into Cyberstein because that is the strategy that I would have used at that event. I think that transition side sets you up the most to win game two or three. 
obviously post the forbidden limitation to CyberSign, you would have had to change the sign date. So I am going to comment on some of the strategies that you could have implemented as opposed to CyberSign, some of the common outs that people had to things like Royal Decree, Jinzo, Death Wombat, some of the critical pieces of counter cards the opponent would likely be side decking during this time. And then as the format progresses, Chamber will just consistently be there in the backdrop, even with the limitations to Chain Strike at the end of the format, Chamber will linger on in Yu-Gi-Oh's history for years and years, decade plus. But I think it's interesting to take a look at the very first time the Chamber was ever a playable strategy. So without further ado, Let's take our very first deep dive look at Chainburn, specifically Chainburn at the moment of its original release. All right, as I alluded to in the introduction, this is a monsterless version of Chainburn. So there will be no Morphing Jar, there will be no Lava Golems, none of that. We'll jump right to the spells and start with three copies of Chain Strike. Chain Strike is really the card that put this deck on the map. It was the card that saw limitations at the end of the format, which didn't totally end this deck, but definitely made it quite a bit weaker. Chain Strike was a card that was single-handedly, with little help in terms of things like Ojama Trio tokens already being on the field, the single card that could do the most damage. More often than not, a single Chain Strike did 2,000 points of damage as Chain Link 5, though if your opponent began the Chain Link through something like Heavy Storm, MST, or just any effect, you theoretically could get it all the way up to Chain Link 6 and deal 2,400 points of damage. And the really crippling thing was when you could have two copies of Chain Strike Resolve, where it was Chain Link 5, Chain Strike, Chain Link 6, Chain Strike. That way you're dealing 4,400 points of damage, and that obviously is just an incredible amount off of just two single cards. So Chain Strike was really the card to put this deck on the map. Then we have three copies of Tremendous Fire, just a consistent 1,000 points of damage. It's a card that you can top deck into and in instantly do damage. You don't have to set it. It's a card that obviously plays around Royal Decree in game two or three, if that's a big concern of yours. So to me, Tremendous Fire, awesome card. It's better than Meteor of Destruction. Meteor of Destruction was another card that you sometimes saw these decks from, but I didn't like the inconsistency of drawing Meteor of Destruction when you couldn't activate it. The 500 points of damage is meaningless when you're playing a deck like this. You're really just trying to consistently deal 8,000 damage as fast as possible, and I don't want limitations with cards like Meteor of Destruction. Then we have Poison the Old Man. Poison the Old Man is good for the Cyberstein side deck, and it's also just a reasonable source of damage. It's a quick play, so obviously you can set it, which makes it a little bit better in that sense than Tremendous Fire. Obviously it doesn't deal as much damage, but Poison the Old Man can be set and then build up a chain link on your opponent's turn. A card like Tremendous Fire doesn't necessarily do that. Occasionally you do need the 1200 points of life, and when I just commented a moment ago how it synergizes somewhat well with Cyberstein in the side deck, this could bump you above 5,000 life so that even though your opponent kind of rushed you below that threshold for Stein's effect, this could actually bring you back above it. It also technically can enable double Cyberstein activations if you happen to draw two copies, gaining 2,400 points of life and then going over 10,000. But these are the nine burn. Then we have a copy of Scapegoats and then Graceful Charity. Obviously, you're going to play Graceful Charity. It is a staple, one of the last parts of Trinity, still legal at this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. Scapegoat obviously doesn't do burn damage, but it's a... A card that you can actually activate on your turn, that matters because if you have six cards in your open hand, you can't set all of them. And a card like Fire Darts, which is a preview of one of the traps, actually requires you to have no hand. So there are situations where you just activate Scapegoats in order to set and activate Fire Darts on your opponent's turn. In addition to that, it's a card that basically buys you at least one battle phase, if not two. We're at a point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history where having four scapegoat tokens pretty reliably gets you through a battle phase. And then often two, right? Your opponent doesn't have a ton of extenders in their deck. If they summon Mystic Tomato and attack and you activated scapegoats, the best that they can do on the next turn is maybe summon Exiled Force and attack two, right? So that actually buys you two, if not into a third battle phase. So it's similar to cards like Threatening Roar and Wabaku but I actually think it buys more turns. So one single copy of Skate Codes, it was in fact limited to one, so we can't run more. So we probably would at least consider it. So those are the spells. For the traps, we have three copies of Just Dessert. Obviously, Just Dessert, in and of itself, can only reliably do maybe 500 to 1,000, but when you combine it with Ojama Trio, that's really when you start to have those massive damage outputs where this card is dealing 2,000 points of damage. Combining really well with Just Desserts is, of course, Secret Barrel. These two cards have been friends in Chain Burn decks really since the time it was originally a deck. So from the moment Cyberdeck Impact was released, all the way up through some of the more modern versions of Chain Burn, we see these six cards. One of the cards was a little bit debatable. It wasn't in every Chain Burn deck. If we're going to cut cards like Lava Golem and some of the other monsters, we do need more burn cards that are traps. Fire Darts is an interesting one because it's 
an inconsistent quantity of damage, which can make the mount a little bit awkward. The way fire darts works is if you have no hand, you can activate it. So it's already a little bit of a drawback relative to other cards in the deck, like Just Desserts and Secret Barrel. But then you roll three six-sided die, and it deals 100 points of damage for the result of each. So for example, if you roll a three, it deals 300. You end up rolling three dice, so the maximum amount that it could do is three times six, which is 1,800 points of damage, which definitely makes the high end pretty fantastic. The low end, however, is that you roll one three times in a row. Very unlikely, but that's obviously the low end. You typically get somewhere in the middle, right? So let's say that this is just a 900 point of burn damage trap card, which makes it, you know, fairly, fairly reasonable in the context of what this deck is trying to do. Right? If cards like Secret Barrel and Just Desserts are the tier 1 burn cards, cards like Fire Darts are definitely tier 2. You never know, though. Sometimes you might hit a 1500, a 1600, and it can be really fantastic. But Fire Darts, it's just another burn card. It wasn't an absolute staple. If you actually go back and look at some of the top 8 decks, not a lot of them actually used Fire Darts, if any of them. Some of them elected to run some of the monsters. But again, if I'm running pure no-monster version to cut back on the likelihood of my opponent resolving Cyber Dragons aboard Nobleman of Crossout, well, we're going to have to find something, and Fire Darts was one of the cards that was an option. Then we have three copies of Jar of Greed. Jar of Greed is just a chain filler. That's really all it does. This is a point you give history where you can very reliably get to see your next turn, even playing against decks like this. So having a card like Jar of Greed isn't a liability where you draw the card but die on your opponent's turn. So triple Jar of Greed. Then we have Triple Accumulated Fortune. This was the most important card in the deck. That might sound surprising when you have a card like Chain Strike that can deal 2,400 points of damage, if not 2,000 points of damage. Accumulated Fortune was actually the card that was the most difficult card in this deck to play correctly. And that, again, that sounds crazy, but one of the mistakes that people made in this format, and really this is the case in all points in Yu-Gi-Oh! history where Chainburn was legal, is they just set their whole hand without any consideration for what that might do if they top deck Accumulated Fortune as their 7th or 8th card. The worst case scenario is when you draw this, but you have no hand. And with this particular type of deck, that can actually happen when you just set a bunch of trap cards, like Just Desert, Secret Barrel, Fire Darts, that don't actually refuel your hand. Yes, they deal a bunch of damage very quickly, but if you only deal 6,000 points of damage and then hope to top deck from that point, you might not actually win because then you're requiring two or three top decks and your deck is filled with cards like this, which don't actually do anything. I mean, that can completely cost you the game. One of the pieces of advice that I have if you actually want to play Chainburn at any point in Yu-Gi-Oh! history is to take into consideration the necessity of keeping cards in your hand, especially cards that have set in stone damage outputs. So for example, if you're not building up a chain, there's almost no reason to set Poison of the Old Man on the first turn because it deals 800 damage no matter when you activate it. If you need to deal 800 points of damage to win, you can just activate it from your hand. But if you keep it in your hand and you wait to draw Accumulated Fortune, now, all of a sudden, when you activate it, it's more than just doing the burn damage. That's part of what this deck is trying to do, but it's also contributing to your chains. And Accumulated Fortune ends up being one of the most important cards because if you don't play this deck correctly, they end up being dead draws. But if you do, in fact, play this deck correctly, which is a little bit more passive than you might anticipate, holding back on some of the spell or trap cards that you can activate at any point, but a lot of players recklessly activate early, now all of a sudden you're taking advantage of what these cards are intended to do, which is to not only deal burn damage, but build up the chains so that you can fuel one of the most important cards in your deck, which is Accumulated Fortune. This deck needs to constantly regain that hand advantage so that it can build up a second and third big chain. And if you leave yourself stranded with Accumulated Fortune, you're just going to lose the game. So Accumulated Fortune is easily one of the most important cards in this deck. It has always been one of the most important pieces in Chain Burn, and understanding not only how to use it, but how to build towards it, and also how to make decisions early in the game so that when you draw Accumulated Fortune, they're still alive, is just absolutely critical to running this deck with any level of success. Then we have two copies of Reckless Greed. It was limited to two, or else we'd, we'd play the three. Reckless Greed is obviously a fantastic card, especially when you draw multiples. Anytime that we have a chain where we resolve Accumulated Fortune, Reckless Greed, and a card like Chain Burn, where we're dealing 2,000 points of damage and getting to draw four cards, it's just absolutely game-breaking. So I know the two draw faces that you lose can be pretty bad, but usually you can draw two burn cards. And if you played this deck in a proper way and got to resolve Accumulated Fortune, and now all of a sudden you have four cards in your hand, you don't really mind missing the draw phase, especially because you're probably just going to win. Another card that I was really a big advocate of, I would even consider jumping it up to three, is Chain Detonation. So Chain Detonation on its own is only 500 points of damage, 
but if it is one of the higher cards in the chain link, four or higher, it actually rebalances to your hand, which means it serves sort of as a pseudo jar of greed effect where it can be placed in the chain, but it actually replaces itself, which is really important. As I just commented on, the last thing you want is to have dead accumulated fortunes because you recklessly chained cards early in the turns. Chain Detonation, though, on the other hand, is a card that lets you build up those chains and then it constantly goes back to your hand. That way, when you activate a card like Accumulated Fortune and you draw two, if Chain Detonation was also in that chain, now all of a sudden you're back to three cards plus your draw phase, you can do a whole nother Accumulated Fortune on the following turn. So Chain Detonation, a fantastic card. I know the 500 points of damage is a relatively low output, all things considered, but one activation is only 500. The second you get to bounce it back to your hand, now it's 1,000, and now it's right there on the level of Tremendous Fire. This one is a little bit debatable. Dimension Wall was not included in all these decks. Some decks had actually all the way up to three of them. It really was one of those tough cards, and it really couples with Magic Cylinder. These are not chainable, obviously. If your opponent plays Breaker, they play MST, they play Heavy Storm, which was legal, of course. These cards don't do anything, which makes them somewhat risky. All of the other cards that I've shown you thus far can be chained to Heavy Storm, and if anything, the Heavy Storm actually helps giving you Chain Link 1, and then you can chain all the way up to Chain Link 6 if your opponent has nothing else to do. These cards are a little bit of a liability, one of the other pieces of advice that I have here is to try and entice your opponent into Heavy Storm early. What that means is, if you have a Dimension Wall and a Magic Cylinder, and you're not using Accumulated Fortune, if you set something like a Jar of Greed and a Secret Barrel early on, you might entice your opponent into playing Heavy Storm, especially if they don't think you're playing this deck. Then once those cards have been activated, going forward, you can start to use D-Walls and Magic Cylinders with much more freedom. You only really have to worry about MST, cards that you can readily deal with. You actually have outs to breaker with things like Ring of Destruction. Granted, that's only one out, but it is technically still an out. So one of the things with these three cards is they are so high in damage output. They also stop damage to you, which can be useful, but you need to be cautious about how you use them. Try and bait out a Heavy Storm. Try to see if your opponent has Heavy Storm by enticing them with a lot of back rows early, and then you can set them with a little bit more freedom. So that's another thing to take into consideration that makes this deck a little bit unique in how you game plan. You could play three Ojama Trios, but I've elected only to run two you really don't want to draw multiples of ojama trio it also conflicts with fire darts right if you open double ojama tree and fire darts you will eventually want to activate fire darts you'll probably end up setting both of these and then you only can activate one of them unless you have the ring of destruction combo which is in some cases an honestly an auto win i'll talk about that in just a second so two ojama trio because of the fire darts though even if you didn't play fire darts not every deck ran three copies of ojama trio it doesn't actually contribute to burn damage inherently it's very unlikely that the tokens get destroyed. However, you obviously have Just Desserts and Secret Barrel that take a lot of advantage from your opponent having Ojama Trio tokens on the field. That's always been the case with Chain Burn decks. Then we have, of course, Ring of Destruction. Ring of Destruction legal during the first iteration of Chain Burn. Absolutely wild to think that because Ring of Destruction is such a powerful card. It is by far one of the highest damage outputs. It also destroys the monster, which helps keep you alive because that monster obviously now can't attack on the following turn. Ring Destruction plus Double Ojama Trio allows you to actually clog your opponent's field with five tokens, right? You play Ojama Trio, you ring one of the three tokens, and then you play another trio. So this was a free win that this deck could sometimes have. Obviously, it was a three-card combo that was very difficult to pull off, but definitely something you want to take into consideration. Then just some one-ups. We have one copy of Wabaku and one copy of Threatening Roar. You could definitely bump up the quantities of these types of cards. If you only wanted to play two, though, you definitely wanted to split it one and one. One thing to take a note of is when you use Chain Burn cards like Accumulated Fortune and Chain Strike, upon the activation of the card, there cannot be two cards with the same name in the chain, which means you can go Chain Link 5 Accumulated Fortune, Chain Link 6, 6 Accumulated Fortune, because the sixth chain there, that second Accumulated Fortune, only recognizes one in the chain up to that point, but you can't activate a third Accumulated Fortune in that chain because that one then would recognize the two previous copies. If you were in dire straits and needed to activate both of these, which is obviously redundant, but if you need it solely for the chain links, you wouldn't be able to go Wabaku Wabaku if you happen to be playing two copies. So you actually do need to split them like this, one roar, one Wabaku. And then yes, from there you could act, add a second threatening roar if you actually wanted a third card that had that similar type of effect. But they basically just filled the chain and kept you alive, similar to cards like Jar of Greed that aren't necessarily doing burn damage, but do contribute broadly to your, your game plan. There's one copy of Ceasefire, which is probably worse than just Desserts. The thing with Ceasefire is there are good flip effects in this format. Granted, if your opponent knows you're playing this deck, they should probably just be summoning Dekoichi and trying to attack you anyway. But you never know. You could actually 
catch them a little bit off guard, though quite honestly, them flipping to Koichi is probably not the worst thing in the world because it actually fuels your secret barrel. But nevertheless, Ceasefire, one of the cards that can have a pretty reasonable damage output. And then a Gravity Bind, which fits into that same conversation as D-Wall and Magic Cylinder. If you can reliably set Gravity Bind post Heavy Storm, and then again, you only have to worry about MST and Breaker in game one, and then maybe Mobius, Gravity Bind in and of itself can just auto win the game because your opponent's going to have a really difficult time dealing with it. I will at least point out that there are monsters that can attack under it in this format, like Mystic Swords in level 2, for example, but your opponent's not going to be able to attack with the Cyber Dragons and Monarchs that are filling their deck and a bunch of the Warrior Toolbox cards that are level 4. So having a free win card like Gravity Bind is definitely something to take into consideration. But those are our traps. So again, absolutely no monsters. Which now brings us to the side deck and the fusion deck. Not the extra deck at this point, the fusion deck. So I did comment on this. I am playing a Cyberstein transition. So we need a Cyberstein side deck or a fusion deck. We have Cyber End Dragon. You actually want more than one copy of this. This deck, because it's running poison, the old man can go above 10,000 life. So definitely have at least two copies. Have two copies of Cyber Twin Dragon. You definitely want Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. That is the highest output singly, just in attack points. Obviously, the Cyber cards, the Cyber End and Cyber Twin, combine really well with Mega Morph and Limiter. From that point, you honestly very rarely will actually need more than just these cards, but you do want everything else just in case, whether that's Gatlin Dragon, Dark Flare, you know, Reaper in case you need to attack directly. These things are so unlikely to need, but you know you might as well have them. Sort of the old Legacy of Darkness collection of fusion monsters. You know, King Dragoon's a good card. Dark Blade, Ojama King, and Last Warrior. You could also throw in just about anything else, but quite frankly, you're not likely to go into anything but these. But it's not bad to have some of these, for sure. But we're going to primarily go into Blue Eyes Ultimate or the Cyber Package. So let's talk a little bit about the side deck. Yu-Gi-Oh! at this point in time, it's really interesting when you go back and look at the decks. Quite frankly, most of the decks were pretty horrible. I say that with a lot of confidence that with modern Yu-Gi-Oh! perspective, the decks at this time period would be significantly changed. But I will at least give you a brief overview of what you could have anticipated if you were to go back and play this format. So there were definitely burn decks. A lot of the burn decks sided into Cyberstein, or they started with Stein and went into burn. So I'm representing this with Wave Motion Cannon, one of the best singular burn cards. But definitely note the possibility that your opponent's going to either have Stein in the main deck or side into burn from Stein in the main deck or vice versa. You know what I'm saying. There was a pretty common version of DD Survivor based Monarch decks with Macro and D Fisher. You know, at this point in time, a lot of people are running Treeborn Frog based Monarch decks. The idea there is if you get rid of the Treeborn Frog through Macro and D Fisher and then exploit cards like DD Survivor, you can end up winning the game. So there was definitely that deck. There were plenty of toolbox warrior based decks, just a ton of them. So here is what I'm going to represent by that. And honestly, if you're not running a toolbox based warrior deck, you could just have these in your deck anyway. I've commented on the quote unquote good stuff deck quite frequently throughout these videos, and there were just tons of good stuff decks. I would almost qualify most decks at this time as good stuff decks. There was a anti Thestalos Dark World deck. What I mean by that is Obviously, Dark Worlds get even better effects when they're discarded by your opponent's card effects. The Stalos was one of the more common monarchs, probably second to Zaborg. Dark Worlds had a little bit of a resurgence here where people were playing the Stalos all over the place, and thus Dark Worlds were a pretty reasonable counter. Graceful Charity was legal, which actually was by far the greatest Dark World card of all time, even though it doesn't say Dark World in its name. The idea of drawing three and discarding two could result in double Dark World hitting the field, and then obviously the draw three is ridiculous. So this particular deck had absolutely one of the most crazy Trinity cards of all time at its absolute best point. So Dark World had a very unique ability to win the game out of nowhere because of Graceful Charity. Then we have, as I alluded to, Treeborn Frog-based Monarch decks. A lot of people refer to it as Spicer Monarch. It was a Monarch deck that had Zaborg, the Stalos, and then the Apprentice engine with our friend Dekoichi. So that was one of the more popular decks. It actually won back-to-back -back events at this time period. Kyle Lopez and Human ran exactly the same deck, at least almost exactly the same deck, based many ways off of the deck that Ryan Spicer used early on in this format. It was a Monarch deck with the Apprentice engine. Tons of people copied it. It was 
by far the most common version of Monarchs, but there are other Monarch decks too. You could play it with Spy, you could play it with Tomato. There's a version of a Tomato beatdown Monarch deck that Mario Matteo ended up topping with during this time period, a well-known player from Comic Odyssey. So yeah, the Apprentice deck was really popular, but there were other versions too. Cyber Dragon was basically just in every deck, so I feel like I should point that out, whether it was in the Monarch deck, whether it was in the Apprentice version, basically everything over here. There was a Cyberstein, or rather a Chimera Tech OTK that was sort of on the fringes. This deck didn't really see a ton of popularity until Cyberstein was emergency banned after this event, when David Rodriguez won with Cyberstein OTK. At the point in time in which Cyberdark Impact was released, they actually emergency banned Cyberstein, which definitely requires us to change the side deck, but I'm sort of being authentic to just that event. And then going forward with the removal of Cyberstein OTKs and the drop in popularity of cards like Karibo, all of a sudden Chimera Tech OTK based decks became pretty popular and did really well. They actually won the second to last Shonen Jump of the format. So they're with more than one of the top eight. There was something like four in the top eight. So it had an incredible, incredible showing after not really doing a lot of damage throughout the format, but machine based, overload fusion based decks. And then I'm just going to point out that a lot of decks had XL Force and Last Will in them, whether that was going into Cyberstein or some other type of play. So tons of decks at this time here, a lot of good stuff decks. There's a, really two different pathways that you could take with the Chain Burn. One is to counter Chain Burn counters, right? Your opponent's going to side Jinzo, Death Wombat. They're going to side in Royal Decree, which is, you know, three cards that instantly beat you if you don't have an out to it, right? Your entire deck is burn cards. Your entire deck is trap cards. If you do not have an out to any of those, you're instantly going to lose, which meant your game plan could be to counter those or to just do something totally different. I put together here that second option, which is, you know what? If you're going to play Royal Decree, I'm going to exploit your Royal Decree and try and kind of sneak a win with Cyberstein. So here is a 15-card Cyberstein transition side where we have three Nimbles, three Steins, and a copy of Breaker. I think Breaker was just a pretty reasonable card. Even if you're side decking in Cyberstein, you have to worry about Royal Decree. So I think Breaker is actually a pretty good card that can, you know, slow the game down a little bit in the sense that your opponent has to deal with it. You're not going to get OTK to this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, at least unless your opponent's running a dedicated deck. You're going to be able to destroy a Royal Decree, which then is going to free up your Jar of Greeds and Reckless Greeds and all the other trap cards that you're keeping in the deck, and then it can attack over something, deal a little bit of incremental damage. So I think Breaker is still a pretty good card. But here is our monsters, and then we have additional Cyberstein cards. We've got three Megamorphs, we have Heavy and two Trunades, plus MST for back row removal, and then a single copy of Limiter. So a very, very streamlined side deck. We transition side these 15 in, and what that ends up looking like. So I'm going to put to the side sort of what the format looked like and talk a little bit about what cards you end up taking out. And then we can talk about what your deck is actually and going to look like. So these can stay in because they at least stop battle. Gravity Mine can stay in. Ceasefire has some application. These are totally fine. Trios, Chain Detonations, are a little bit too committed to just the burn strategy. Definitely Fire Darts, definitely Secret Barrel, definitely Just Desserts, and then definitely the Tremendous Fires. And this is actually going to leave us with a couple cards that we need to keep. Actually, Just Desserts, Secret Barrels were good. It was the Chain Strikes that we actually consider cutting. So if we side out these 15 cards, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you're citing out most of just the dedicated burn cards. I could see you keeping in a drama trio because it can slow down the game and you can attack over them with Cyber End Dragon. So I guess there's a little bit of a debate about keeping these in. As a matter of fact, I'll side deck out this and keep these in. That's definitely a consideration there. But these are really the most dedicated burn cards. And if you side these out, what you are left with is a deck that can actually still function reasonably well because you have Poison the Old Man, which can obviously deal damage that you need to deal if the Cyberstein OTK doesn't quite deal 8,000, but it can actually push you above 5,000. These are just perfect cards. This draw engine is totally reasonable, right? You're still trying to draw into the OTK. If you draw Accumulated Fortune early, you get one off. You hopefully can draw into the pieces that you need. So those cards all have total functionality. And then we have Ring, which I know can affect your life points, but is still defensive. These are totally reasonable in buying new turns. This can just stall you out. These can all stop battle, all four of these. Really, quite frankly, all six of these. So those are totally reasonable. 
a ceasefire. If we are playing the Cyberstein deck, we actually do care a little bit more about our opponent getting advantage off of flip effect. So that's fantastic there. And then you might need a little bit of chip burn damage to actually get over the finish line because if you have to megamorph a cyber end dragon that's just five thousand that's just eight thousand damage over a monster that might not actually deal you enough to win the game sometimes when you do it with cyber twin dragon it might not be enough to win the game either so having a little bit of chip burn damage here or there is actually really useful just in case you don't actually deal eight thousand damage with one cyber stein play basically one stein plus megamorph limiter play plus something like secret barrel just wins you the game so to me our deck is still relatively functional. If you look at the cards we cited out, there's really nothing in here that I think stands out as absolutely necessary, especially, especially when we consider what cards are left in the deck. So that's the transition side. Other option. Let's say you are not a fan of the transition side. Well, then you need to have an entire side deck devoted to trying to counter cards like Death Wombat. So one of the cards that a lot of people played were Zajura Priest. Azura Priest could attack obviously over all your opponent's monsters, so it could actually do a little bit of damage. Its effect is actually going to cause a chain link in the end phase, and then it has enough attack to, do, to go over Death Wombat. So that was a really common card. If we are really afraid of Royal Decree, we have Twister and MST, obviously. That one goes without saying. But we can have you know four copies of a quick play that can destroy Royal Decree. Another card that I don't have here, but was an interesting one, was called Double Snare. The card basically says, destroy a card on the field that is negating trap cards. Which, in other words, means destroy either Royal Decree or Jinzo. It was one of the only cards in Yu-Gi-Oh's history that could actually deal with both of those. Some people cited cards like Snipe Hunter to do that too, which was a new release in Cyberduck Impact, but I was never a big fan of Snipe Hunter, so I wouldn't consider doing that. And then Breaker, even though I have it in the transition side, is another card that can summon, attack over Desuwa Math, destroy Royal Decree, so another fantastic card. So you'd actually want to have cards like this, I think this transition side is a little bit better personally. I, I don't like the idea of having to rely exclusively on weakening the consistency of the actual chain burn part of our deck to try and out cards when the type of cards our opponent could have that literally cause us to lose on the spot are so con contrasting, right? You need outs to Jinzo, Dust Wombat plus Royal Decree, which means you need these, but if your opponent has Wombat and you have these, that doesn't do anything. If you have a Jura Priest and your opponent has Royal Decree, that doesn't do anything. Breaker is a unique card that can actually sort of deal with both, but then how are we dealing with Jinzo? And it's not like it's one of those things where it's like, okay, we can just, you know, draw out of this. You instantly lose the game, right? If you cannot deal with those cards, you often do not have a lot of time from that point, once those cards are on the field, to really get out of it. So I think having the transition side is much better because you can take advantage of the fact that your opponent might have Royal Decree, and then you just Cyberstein OTK them out of nowhere. One thing to consider... In addition to these 15 that I don't actually have in the 15, but one other card that I've never really pointed out as functioning really well with this strategy is Emergency Provisions. It's another cool card in decks that played Cyberstein during this time period because what you could do is activate a bunch of cards and then Emergency Provisions and send them all to the graveyard and boost your life points above either 5,000, let's say you took a lot of damage early, or above 10,000 to use Double Stein. And in a deck that actually has a bunch of chain burn cards, you can pretty reliably get an Emergency Provisions to resolve and gain 4,000 life, which is obviously plenty of life to work with. And as I just alluded to, could be enough to make you double Stein, which at that point is basically always game because double Cyber Twin Dragon is basically impossible to deal with. But nevertheless, that's Joji Orlando for Yu-Gi-Oh! History. Thank you for watching. Check back soon for plenty more Yu-Gi-Oh! content.